we're all imperfect. And on this podcast, I'll be chatting with a variety of interesting people who are willing to make themselves vulnerable by sharing their own struggles and imperfections. Like, I just wanted to go back to being a kid, like, who's... Yeah. No one knows who you are. Mm. You're just a son. I don't want to be going and play in front of millions of people and everything gets picked apart. Like, I just want to be the kid who's sitting there with mum and dad. I'm Hugh Van Kylenberg from The Resilience Project. And I'm Ryan Shelton from My Mum. And I'm Josh from Hugh's Mum. And this is The Imperfects. God, it feels good to be back. It really does. I'm giddy. I feel like I said that last year. Yeah, I think you said it in the intro, in the trailer app as well. But Did I really? Yeah. Giddy? Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm twice as giddy. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm giddier. Yeah. <laughs> My giddy is up. Giddy up. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I, I'm i just so excited. It's I'm great. Just, it's mm. great to be back. Yeah. I mean, we had like the, the preseason training last week. Like we mm. had like our first sort of like non episode. It was a bit of an unnecessary episode. I don't know why we did it. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of helpful stuff in there, really. No. I don't no. think. <laughs> no. We well, there was to... sleeping positions. That's true. Unless someone found themselves in your sleeping position. And... <laughs> but anyway, yes. What a, and what a way to come back as well with, with the captain of the Australian cricket team. Oh, Pat Cummins. Before we get into Pat and in getting excited about Pat, which we all are, uh, I just want to remind everyone, if you didn't hear the episode last week that we did, um, which you may have missed. I reckon fine. people tuned out about halfway through my yeah. sleeping position. Yeah. Fair enough, too. Yeah, absolutely fair enough. <laughs> absolutely fair I'm enough. I'm surprised we kept that in, but yeah. yeah more of a visual <laughs> thing, really. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to remind people, if you haven't heard, that this year on The Imperfects, we are adding a new weekly episode. Uh, which is a little mini episode, which will come out on Thursdays. So this Thursday uh, is the first one. It's called The Imperfix. And that is like a flashback, short episode, flashback to an old episode from years ago, maybe. Uh, just sort of playing you a little thing, just to remind you of helpful things that people have said over the years. Um, and I just wanted to bring it up, first of all, to remind people to check for it on Thursday, but also to play the intro, which... Um, I don't know. I felt like if it just came out of the blue on Thursday, it would be a bit strange. <laughs> so I just thought it'd be <laughs> just helpful. Run now. Yeah. yeah, just oh, yeah. a bit of a soft okay. launch. Okay. Uh, yeah. So can we can we play that intro? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Hi there. I'm like the imperfect. Oh yeah, sort of. But I'm a quick fix. Yeah, if you're in a hurry or something. I'm a helpful mix of archival tips from episodes past. You can listen to me fast. Da, 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 da. Get ready for this. Yeah, why not? Won't take long. I'm an episode of The Imperfects. <laughs> yeah. So. Did you work in FM radio at all? <laughs> <laughs> Have you done that before? Is it that obvious? <laughs> Damn it. Yes, I oh, did. I love it. It's, it's very good. It good. is very good. It's going to be interesting when it's quite a dark or, imper- serious. or a serious Imperfects for us to do an intro switch from that. Well, but... well yeah, well, it will be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Josh. It yeah. will be very but interesting. That's the challenge of it, I guess. Exactly. It's the fun of it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very good. And I will I will go back and listen to it again. Look, it's something <laughs> we might change it along the way if it seems a little bit strange, which it no doubt is. So, uh, yeah, it's that's, brilliant. at least it's that's really where good. it's starting. That's <laughs> yeah. where it's starting. Well, yeah. speaking of brilliant, Pat Cummins, he's just, I have to say, I we, we I often get asked, when we have different people in the studio, what were they like before and after the interview? And mm. I can, I was very happy to report back to everyone who asked that he is everything you would want and so much more. Oh, he, it's such a well lovely guy. I'm not a big cricket fan, um, but I'm a big Pat Cummins fan. Patrizio, <laughs> he's not referred to that very much, but yeah, I, ever, <laughs> ever. Um, but uh, he, God, what a lovely guy. Such good insight. So interesting to hear about. Yeah. His life as well, obviously. I yeah. keep reflecting back on the wrong thing. I just, I really regret. Throughout that interview, I, I, I was very distracted by one thing, which you guys will probably know what it was, but I regret the shorts that I wore um, for that interview. Oh, I don't remember. Oh. It was it was five days after I'd had my, um, I'd had the snip. I'd had the vasectomy done. Okay. Oh, yeah. And from the way it was reported back to me, a vasectomy was you go in, they give you the snip and you can pretty much go to back to work that afternoon yeah. and it's yeah. fine. But you don't have to wear the chaps, do you? <laughs> that was, I thought it was just a choice. <laughs> so I had a vasectomy done five days before the interview. And even when we looked when Pat was going to be turning up, I thought, no, no, five days. Is, I, mean, I planned to train like running three days after yeah. the vasectomy. Hmm. Tonight, what's today? So the, so we had, so Pat came in on the 23rd of December. Yeah, he came in just before Christmas. Yeah. yeah. I had the vasectomy on the 18th of December. It is now the, we, we are recording this now on the 15th of February. Mm-hmm. 
I still am in pain. Are you really? Yeah. That doesn't sound right. No. Well, there was a. It was one hell of a process. Like the. Well, I mean, yeah, it makes sense that it would still hurt. But no one else is still hurts for, and oh. no one else is. There was one of the things you sign. You sign a form saying these things might happen, and one of them, the oh, things God. that you. <laughs> one of them, I don't really want to know about. <laughs> <laughs> what, what a, now there is a chance obviously we slip so <laughs> um, obviously you'd be comfortable if the whole thing's gone um, <laughs> like you wake up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, excuse me doc uh, my dick's gone <laughs> <laughs> yeah no you didn't read the contract that's always a possibility it is a possibility we can Lorraine bob at you but um, yeah you never know you never never know <laughs> That's why we get you to sign the contract beforehand. Yeah. Ah, oh, thanks, that, Doc. That, now I get it. I that's understand. That's called in the contract. <laughs> right. You might Bob get Lorraine bobbited. <laughs> mm. The uh, so <laughs> one of the things in the in the contract says that I can't remember what's called. It's like like permanent aching balls syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> that's not. That's, <laughs> it's something like that. Like pabs. Little... Pabs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you haven't got pabs, do you? <laughs> yeah, that lasts a while, mate. Like forever, <laughs> Lots forever. Yeah. yeah permanent I mean, it's topical what it feels like is in when you're playing cricket if you play cricket for a while you will at some point get hit in the balls tabs you will get what's yeah. tabs temporary yeah. oh yeah <laughs> tabs you'll get tabbed and um, and you have that pain in your stomach for the next like five to ten minutes and it's awful mm. I kind of have that still oh. like yeah so it's been mm. anyway have you so, spoken to the doctor about it oh yeah we have been in cahoots over the summer holidays. <laughs> cahoots? <laughs> Sounds like you're going to be able to rub a bank. <laughs> yeah, me and the doc are in cahoots. Ooh, what about? Just talking about my balls. My balls. <laughs> Jeez. So I, I sent him a message about a week after saying, I think it's quite bad. And he said, yeah, well, it would be. Like seven days before that, we just sliced open your... Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, yep. and um, and we we burnt things and then tied them off and then we yeah so it's going to be bad for another probably some people are fine but you're obviously one of those people that's going to draw on for a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks later, it was Christmas. We we're down at it was just after Christmas. We were away with the family, and we we're staying in a smallish kind of beach house. Penny's parents are there as well. The kids are there, and we have my gosh, having like kids running around at that height as well. Like it's just so dangerous. But the amount of times I at that height. Well, just they're that. Oh, hitting. But, yeah, just yeah. like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just wear that. Perfect shot. Yes. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so I'm in coats with the, I, I, the the surgeon said, look, I'm going away. I was really panicking with my mm. message. I was saying, this is not, something doesn't feel right. And he said, look, if it's still hurting, you know, 20 days in, let me know. 20 days in, I'm in quite a bit of pain. So I sent him a text message because he gave me his mobile number. He's away down at the beach house, whatever. I'm picturing he's at a beach house. Mm-hmm. And he said, um, he said, he said, would you mind um, sending me a photo um, of them? Mm. And I went, oh, he said, oh, don't worry, I'll delete them. Um, I was like, oh, I know, I didn't think you were going to, but showing all your friends. <laughs> yeah, okay. And I said, yeah, I, I guess I can. So he's essentially, when I say I was in cahoots with him, I was sending him dick pics. Um, <laughs> Jeez. So I was in the bathroom. This is not the intro I expected to Pat Cummins. No. <laughs> All no. the season. I mean, I mean, to stay on trend, I was expecting no ball, but um, we got plenty. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. So I had to go in the bathroom and I I was like, I'm, I can't believe I'm doing this, but I took photos for him and I mm. thought I'll, I'll go up really close just in case mm. anyone sees the photo. It's like only obvious to him what it is. Mm. And I oh, sent it yeah. to him and he said, oh, I'd like to be able to see everything if that's okay. Can I see your face? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I went, I had to like go back and do it again and f- photographed everything for him. And so I sent it through to him and he, he said, look, it's, he said, well, actually, it depends on the details. He said it's actually infected and that very, very rarely happens. Mm. So, so you, was, can, you, can, you, can you send him again? But can you put like a footy player's uniform on when you send it? <laughs> <laughs> and like a, I don't know, can you just like get a bit dirty? <laughs> just be interested to see it from that point of view. <laughs> So um, anyway, so the whole point of the story is that I sent him these pictures and he diagnosed what was going on and I straight away deleted them from my phone because the, one of the kids' favourite, um, we've managed to keep our, we're, I'm not, no judge from people, haven't, we've managed to pretty much keep our kids away from devices. They mm-hmm. think the only reason you have a device is for photos. We let them look at our photos. Oh, yeah. Like, well, I better take these photos off. So I deleted mm-hmm. the photos. And the next morning we're all sitting around the kitchen table and I'm sitting next to um, and my mother-in-law. And my iPad was there and one of the kids said, can I look through your photos? And I went, uh, yep, it's rest time. You can do that. Yep. And I opened up the iPad. You hadn't removed the photos yet? 
I had for my phone. But, oh, but not in the iCloud. Thought, I thought that yeah. meant that they're all gone. It should be, but it probably hadn't sunk yet. And because I had to have quite a few goes at it. I haven't <laughs> oh. chatted to my mother-in-law about this yet. I don't know if she saw. It was like, like my one of my kids opened up the iPad and it was just this collage of like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But does it look medical or? Well. Or you were trying to impress the doctor, so you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, doc, I will send you a photo. Can you give me ten minutes? <laughs> it's not quite ready. Just got out of the pool, so I might just. <laughs> it was just this collage of, and it was, I. So one of my kids' hands was on top of the keyboard, and with little care for their hand draw, I slammed it shut so quickly it was like a, it was like a venus fly trap you see just closed so quickly on something i just slammed yeah. it down i don't know if my mother-in-law saw it i have no idea i don't want to ask i don't really want to we just i just does she listen to the show well she does i was just thinking as yeah. i was saying that i'm gonna find out but it was yeah. mortifying i didn't talk for the rest of the day i just i was <laughs> just nothing says guilty like a laptop slam down <laughs> on a child's hand, <laughs> <On a> child's <laughs> hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just also to be clear, like I didn't, no one's hands were hurt. I did. Yes, I was. Of course, I slammed it, but in a nice way. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? It, yeah. Well, well, at least you got context now. Yeah, yeah. There's context for it. Anyway, do you know no. before I went into the um, operating theater, you feel quite vulnerable before any surgery. Yeah. Just lying there, mm. and I saw all the staff when I opened the door. There was like seven or eight staff in there, and I'm thinking, gosh, all these people are going to see me with my yeah. pants down. That's a bit of a weird feeling. Yeah. Mm. And. I was lying there thinking, well, I mean, no one knows who I am. It's fine. Like it's 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 just another operation for them. And even if they do, it probably helps that you're from a show called The Imperfects. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that checks out. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, even on brand down there. <laughs> anyway, this guy came over and goes, wasn't going to say this, but mate, love the podcast. Oh, love the podcast. And I felt so uncomfortable that that's, that's that man, yeah. yeah not, anyway. We didn't really pick the right year to put all our episodes on YouTube, did we? So we're going to have to have like <laughs> photography included in this. We're going to have to have some supporting <laughs> visions. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry about that, everyone. Photos are well and truly deleted. Yeah. Good. Anyway, um, from that to Pat Cummins. Yeah. All the cricket mm. fans who've tuned in to hear Pat, what a treat. <laughs> <laughs> from around the world hopefully uh yes but no pat cummins <laughs> we won't hold you up any longer let's get right to he's, he's to had pat. an extraordinary life so talking about um his journey um his take on um leadership his some of the heartbreaking situations he's found himself in um and his philosophy on on how you i think get the most out of yourself and the people around you mm. it's it's really great mm. he's just oh boy pat cummins pat cummins here he is Well, I am um, I'm excited, but I know Hugh and Josh are insanely excited about this about this episode. Well, for two people who grew up just wanting to play cricket for Australia, and I yeah. think we still would like to play cricket for Australia. <laughs> if it's an option, but I don't think it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah never too late. I think the Australian cricket captain is probably the pinnacle of where you... Yeah. Pat Cummins is here, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It is... Very, very exciting to have you here. Um, how's this for a typo before we start? Just for well, Pat knows because I made the typo to him. But mm. Pat and I were message. I, I picked Pat up this morning from the hotel, and I was messaging about. Never done that before, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that is a new service that I haven't. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you said last night, oh, I'll pick him up at eight fifteen. I was like, you're picking him up. <laughs> Jeez, keen much? <laughs> I do have a few errands tomorrow, actually, Hugh. If you want to. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you just you just send them through, mate. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, and I was trying to work out when I'd pick him up and I said, uh, finish by saying, anyway, mate, very excited to look you up tomorrow. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah. I actually just looked over your shoulder at your notes here and the first it's, you've got like heading Pat Cummins. First line, lick him up. <laughs> like, well, I don't know what this interview is. No. I'll let you lead it to you. <laughs> lick him up. You know, we just said hey, I've entered very open-minded. So <laughs> <laughs> <That's> great, <yeah. laughs> you just know when you're texting someone and, and like, you said it's a typo, and you're like, oops, sorry. Yeah. I was mortified. I was like, oh, my God. Brilliant. It's terrible. Anyway. Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, how are you, Pat? Well, thanks. Yeah. Good good year of cricket. Pretty good, yeah. Yeah, yeah good. Yeah, ticked a few things off. Yeah, knocked, knocked over a few wickets. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> smash, <laughs> smash some bales over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. 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 I get it. I get it. Sorry, here you. So let me. So I might <laughs> let me. <laughs> let me. Talk, talk. Let me yeah. talk. Shut up, Shelton. <laughs> um, I. The other thing that happens that, that I've done for a first, which I've done before, is so Bridge will always write a bio for me, which I'll then look through and read out. And I said, Bridge said to me, "I'll leave this one to you. You probably know Pat's bio better than the internet does." Um, <laughs> and I said, "I probably know it better than Pat does, to be honest." But, um, so I actually wrote it out. I actually ended up writing two pages as a bio. Wow! <laughs> and so are, you gonna, are you planning on reading them? No. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to summarize. I'm going to do it. Okay. In, I'm trying to do it in, in 45 seconds. Just okay. I'm going to try and summarize Pat in 45 seconds. But okay. um, objectively speaking, Pat is one of the greatest fast bowlers of all time. Um, and by the time he finishes captaining Australia, he will also be um, considered one of the greatest captains in the history of the game. Um, well, now I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nervous. That's a lot. Yeah, to... <laughs> what an opener! A lot to live up to. Um, let's let's see let's see if your first drops just as good as the opening. <laughs> oh my god! That's <laughs> cricket. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, um, I'm really not a cricket fan. <laughs> Would you, would you call like the person who bats at three? Do you ever call them first drop? Nah, <laughs> isn't that what it is? It used to be. It yeah. used to be. Yeah. Yeah. Growing up, like, yeah. Oh, I've shown my age. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so Pat debuted for Australia when he was eighteen. And do you know that makes you? Do you know where that puts you as far as of all time age youngest? I think, I think second in tests and then youngest for T Twenty One days. Yeah. See, this is absolutely <sighs> incredible. Like I, I thought it was seventeen. Have I got that wrong in my head? Uh, New South Wales played when okay. I was seventeen. Right. Yeah. So just for, for people who don't know cricket as well, and if, if you're used to football, a lot, there's a lot of 18-year-olds playing. There's only – so a guy called – do you know who the youngest player ever is to debut for Australian Test Cricket? Yes. Uh, Ian Craig, is it? Correct, in the 1950s. <laughs> he was only like 80 days younger than you were. Wow. So you're the second youngest ever. In, that, that is absolutely mm. extraordinary. Um on debut, Pat took uh, six for seven. I'll do this in forty-five seconds. Pat took <laughs> <laughs> Pat took six for seventy-nine on debut. Um, That's he, six wickets for seventy-nine runs. Yeah, yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Um, lofted Dale Stain over cover to hit the match-winning runs. So Ryan, just for your context, hitting someone at lofting over someone, like, I, I think in my mind, it's the coolest thing you can do in cricket. Yeah, I think so. Um, that's what <laughs> that's what Paddy did when he was eighteen. Uh, wow. And Dale Stain's probably the best fast bowler in the world. Oh at the time. yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, you must have. Like facing Dale Stone as an eighteen-year-old, I was scared. That's why I was swinging at that. But oh. was, <laughs> I should probably jump in here and say it was the little leg spinner that I hit for four. But I, I prefer the Dale Stone. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep running with that. I thought it was Dale Stone. That, that's my okay. Uh, you're a man of the match in that game um, on your debut. Mm. Yes. Wow. Do you know what? I actually didn't know that for sure. I just looked at the scorecard last night and assumed you must have been. Am yeah, I right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, however. Pat didn't play, so that was his first test match. Pat then didn't play another test match for another five years, three months, and 27 days. Is there a reason for that? Injuries. Injuries, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, pretty rough, not selected <laughs> after. <laughs> <laughs> An array of heel and back injuries, which I've heard Whoa. a lot of people say it's because you're bowling. Some people have said it might be because of your efforts on the dance floor in, at Capri's in Cape Town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if that was the case, I think Mitch Marsh would have similar injuries okay. for a few years. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, it was in that time that we met. I don't think that would make Pat's highlights of the life of his career, but certainly mine. Out at New South Wales Cricket uh, back in 2017. Um, Pat came back into the side. Okay, I'm, I'm taking too long. He came back into the side, um, was ridiculously good in all aspects of the game, especially leadership. He then became captain, um, a bowling captain, which is incredibly mm. rare. Uh, I mean, I did it, so Pat and I are quite rare in that regard, I guess. Uh, just, just in case you haven't picked it up, Pat uh, Hugh was a cricket player. He was a fast bowler. <laughs> just wanted to make that clear. And a captain, obviously. Yeah, captain. I'm not sure fast was probably ever used to describe it, but that's okay. Um, one of the best things about Pat, uh, one of the things I love most about him is he stands up for what he believes in, most notably environmental sustainability. Um, after a tough couple of games, a few people who should probably know better said he shouldn't be captain anymore. So this is me going back to doing a very quick intro. Mm -hmm. Um, a few people said he shouldn't be captain. He then went on to win the World Test Championship. He retained the Ashes and then won the World Cup in the One Day Internationals um, in the space of three months. In summary, he's just the best. Um, welcome, Pat. Thanks for the intro. Wow. <laughs> How does that go for a, a brief summary? 
Yeah, I, I could listen to that for hours. That okay. was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I want to start. There's, there's so many things I want to get to here, um, but I want to kick off with this. So earlier this year, I was, um, we've got, we're talking about this in the car. We've got three kids. Our three-year-old was in her room and she made this noise. It was like this scream I've never heard before. Then she went silent and our six-year-old ran in and said, um, Elsie's got her fingers stuck in the cupboard. And mm. I ran in and she was staying there white as a ghost and her finger, the, the, like the cupboard door had completely closed on her finger and her fingers were in there. And I yelled down to Penny, my wife downstairs, and she said, what's happened? And I said, I said, Elsie's done a Pat Cummins. <laughs> That was what I said, and I, 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 I looking, instinctually said that. <laughs> looking the back, and Penny is probably like, <laughs> Penny is probably like, what? He hit the top off stop. Like <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when you were and then this guy, I reckon this gets glossed over. I'd like to hear more about. People will go, yeah, he lost the tip of his, he lost the tip of his fingers when he was young. Can can you tell us what happened? And and yeah, I, I just want to hear a bit more detail. It's usually glossed over pretty quickly. Yes, I, I'm a big family, five kids. Um, I went to preschool, so I was four years old. I'd been given five lollipops at preschool, one for me and my siblings. So I went home, gave it to my brothers and sisters, but my sister was in the bathroom for some reason. I like just cranked the door open a little bit and was waving the lollipop through the door, bathroom door. And uh, Laura came, slammed the door, basically on the tip of my middle finger of my right hand, and it just came straight off. So... Wow. Basically the top knuckle upwards. It came straight, like popped straight off. Straight off, oh. straight on the ground. And how old were you then? Four. Four. So, yeah. Do you just, have a memory of it? Like, or I, are you told, is that what you were told had happened? No, I, I faintly remember running down the hallway, like my hand just pissing out blood. Oh. <laughs> and screaming for mum. And um, and then. You screamed out, I've done an Elsie Van Kylenberg. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> uh, and then. Yeah, just wrapped it up, went to hospital in the ambulance. Um, so I was four. I mean, dad or mum, you know, tells a, f a funny story where um, mum was worried in the hospital, in the emergency department, being like, oh, no, he's going to school next year. Like, none of the girls are going to want to hold his hands as they're walking to class. Meanwhile, dad was flicking a remote in his hand. Mum's like, what are you doing? Dad's like, I'm just making sure I can still bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Wow. Clear priorities from early age. <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, because that is your bowling hand, right hand. Yeah, so that's yeah. my bowling hand. So not only that, that, that's like your line and length finger. Yeah. Like that's the finger that helps you. They, like that's yeah. control. I, I mean, as I said, I was four and I remember that kind of episode and I was probably in the cast for a few weeks and it was too small to sew back on or something like that, you know, the surgeon said. But other than that, I've never really thought of it or, you know, yeah. affected me at all. So There's also, this is a very weird reference, but there's a, it's a guy called Django Reinhardt who was like the father of kind of the best jazz, first jazz guitarist from the 20s. He burnt his hand in a fire, I think, and could only use two fingers on his left hand. And it meant he played guitar differently to everyone who had mm. played previously. And he kind of invented French jazz guitar and he's still the best. And he could only use two fingers. And there's something, I don't know, there's something in like, Mm, having to, to do it a little bit differently to the way other people do it, I think that can sometimes bring forth something yeah. great. I think that's so true. It's like it kind of forces you to problem solve, even though it's very even normal. Even you don't know that's what you're doing, but it just means that you're doing it in a different way. It's a for, Yeah, it's like a forced parameter mm. that you have to work within. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't expect to bring up Django Reinhardt that early. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would have if you did. <laughs> <laughs> um, your, your childhood sounds... I mean, you said there you're one of five um, growing up in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales. It sounds like a very, a very quintessential Australian experience growing up playing a lot of sport in the backyard. Is that? Yeah, that's that's spot on. Uh, summer was just cricket. Uh, a little bit of tennis around Aussie Open. We would sneak onto the tennis courts up the road. Um, and then winter, we'd try everything. AFL, you know, rugby league would watch. Touch footy. I think I got a few days of school for netball. Like I tried everything as kids. Um so it was great. Two older brothers, two or older sister, younger sister. There's always something happening. We're always outside. Um, I love the. I heard you talking to Mark Howard about the rules of your backyard cricket. Can, <laughs> can you, especially Josh, will really appreciate this. Can, can you talk us through the rules of your backyard cricket? <laughs> it's a great. I love how innovative one of the rules was. Yeah, it's um, pretty stock standard. It was quite a big backyard, slight, slight downhill, so really favoured the bowlers. Um, 
Mm. And you could only run if it went past a certain tree. And then if you hit it kind of into the garage, that was four runs on the full, it was six. And then if you hit it over the fence, it was half out. So you had to, if you did it twice, obviously you're out. But mm. they both had dogs. So if it got a bit too close to the dogs and you're shit scared, you're fully out. That was the rule. So <laughs> so you had to get the ball back. So you had to go and get the ball back. So, yeah, my oldest brother would hit it over and if the dogs were anywhere close, he would just forfeit. He's like, yeah, I'm out. Yeah, <laughs> next That's foot. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a full out. Yeah, yeah. it's a full out. <laughs> how, how much of an impact did your childhood experience of cricket in the backyard with your family, like, you know, influence the person you are now? Yeah, huge. I mean, I'm the youngest, so Matt and Tim, a few years older. But I remember, like, whatever we played, whatever sport, contest, cards, like, there was never, ever a handicap for being younger. It was like, okay, mm. me versus Matt, who's six years older, and I've got to try and beat you. And super competitive and, would yeah, play for hours. So I, I just remember always being the little kid who was just like, no, nah, I'm going to knock off my older brother. Um, whatever we're doing. And that was mainly through footy, cricket, like anything we played. Do you think, do you think you're think you a better player because you were one of the younger kids versus the oldest kid? Absolutely, yeah. Mm. So, you know, I'd go to play cricket in my own age group and I was like, this is nothing compared to what I mm. have to deal with in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those guys are scary. <laughs> there must have been a, t a point in your childhood or teenage years where even though you were younger, there must have been a point, obviously, where you're clearly better than them because they're not the Australian cricket captain now. So, <laughs> so. it's I reckon around about 15, 16 is where, yeah, I mean, you're not fully grown, but I was bowling pretty quick by then. Mm. And I think quick translates well across all age groups. Yeah. More mm -hmm. so than, you know, being skillful as a batter or whatever. So it was around about that age you start playing with fully grown men and um, yeah, it was around about then I reckon where I was turning up on a Saturday going, oh wow, I think I'm as quick as anyone I'm going to play here today. Mm. Maybe I've not just still you know, good for my age group, maybe mm. I am actually good for compared to um, you know, anyone. Wow. Um, so I want to start with your family, I guess, here. I, How long so, do you want to stay with them for? Okay. <laughs> Strange time to ask <laughs> over Christmas. Uh, Christmas. So I want to stay with your family. What's the best way to do that? <laughs> Are they down here for Christmas, or do I need to go up to? Mm. Very good. Um, so I, I myself this year, Pat, I've, I've had like a really, I've had a really challenging year this year for for a variety of reasons. Some we discussed in the car on the way here, and I found myself um, reading a lot about stoicism or the Stoics throughout the year. And um, for those who are not familiar with, Sto with Stoicism, it's an ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, basically life philosophy. It's really fascinating and a lot of it's about coping and being resilient and being strong. Um, and the peak time of me reading was actually during the ashes. So we went away on a holiday, the family, and because we had that time away, I took a book and I was reading heaps about it. And I kept... So I was watching you on the television and I had to turn it off at 10 o'clock at night because that was the end of the first session. And if I watch beyond that I couldn't sleep I was too worked up about everything that was going on the amount of times I would read a quote and I'd think about you with all that you were going through with your life was quite extraordinary and there's one I want to read to you here because I I read this and I thought of you straight away in the context of your 2023 so this is Marcus Aurelius on enduring tough times and 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 prevailing he says be like the rock that waves keep crashing over it stands unmoved and the raging of the sea falls still around it. I love that so much, but it makes me, it just made me think about you. I'd love to talk about your, well, the back half of 2023, I guess. So you are in India in a test series over there, which is, um, I think, as tough as assignment as you could probably get as, yep. as a cricketer. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you're playing in a test match and you receive news that your mum's not well. Um, and from all, from a couple of my very good friends who were away with you at that time, no one else really knew. You didn't really tell anyone. You kept that to yourself. Yeah. A few people knew. Okay. So, you know, a couple of probably half the players yep. or ma maybe not quite half. Um, and a couple of the coaches knew. Yeah. And it was, I mean, yeah, mum, mum was sick for a fair while. So it wasn't necessarily new to some yep. of the guys, but. Yeah, I, I knew when I was getting on that plane that I was going to have to come back in a couple of weeks right, okay. pretty much. And I, I reckon 
maybe only a handful of people knew that was, that was going to be the case. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you fly home to see your mum, and you got to see your mum while she was still alive. Yeah, about yeah. ten days, to, uh, okay. two weeks. Yeah. How was it being away from your mum, knowing? I mean, when you get on the plane to go to India, yeah. You said just then you felt like you'd definitely be coming home. What's that feeling like flying away, to, to, you know, away from home at at such a tough time? Yeah, that, that that's I reckon the hardest time in my life, easily, and I I probably felt it. I reckon the twelve months leading in any any time I flew away, I was like, you know, time's finite here. I'm making a deliberate choice to go and play somewhere rather than spend it at you know at home basically. Um, but that time in particular, cause yeah, we, we kind of knew roughly the timeline. Um, and yeah, and knowing mom and dad as well, like how much joy they get sitting together watching me play. I, I, that kind of gave me enough confidence to go and play and they wanted, you know, they were desperate for me to go and play. And I knew I would kind of be able to hop on a flight anytime, come back, but yeah, like for those couple of weeks I was in India, especially now I look back on it, like my mind was not in India. It mm. was back home the whole time. Mm. Yeah. It's because, because, um, and I don't follow the, I don't follow the cricket. So I don't, I, I don't know what was going on at that time, but like I imagine cricket press and fans are pretty critical, maybe at some, some, sometimes, yeah. or all press really. But did the public know why you were going home? Was that a known thing? No, not initially. Um, so I think I, I did the press conference and I didn't mention anything. And I went straight to the airport and then I think um, I think I got spotted in Singapore or something and kind of came out that I was going home for a few days. And I, I think there was a lot of heat. Like I, for those couple of weeks, I just didn't even look at my phone. Like I, mm-hmm. nothing good to be gained from that. And, no. you know, I was where I wanted to be and be present and everything like that. But I, I had, I remember my manager and a couple of other kind of people around me that I normally listen to were, were kind of calling me being like, I think we got to just give a little bit of a reason why, you, why you've gone home. I'm like, no, nah, don't care. <laughs> and he's like, no, nah, no, nah, like you're getting a lot of heat here. Like, I think you got to explain yourself. And I was like, honestly, I do not care what people think. Mm. And I think after about six or seven days when I knew I wasn't going to come back to India, I think we said our oh, mum's in palliative care. Um, but at that, that stage, I, yeah, just literally could not have cared less about what anyone was saying about me. Yeah. Is there also an aspect of not, because I'm, I'm just trying to, I mean, I can't imagine what that was like, but whenever I've, whenever I've had to face something really tough, the idea of it being shared with people I don't know makes me feel really uncomfortable was it also not just that you didn't care but also that it kind of you didn't want to share what is the most intimate and personal thing you, someone can go through uh, yeah 100 percent. and like mum was a super private person dad is as well so like i i know i know mum wouldn't want any attention at all mm. so that's that's probably the the main reason um but too like i just wanted to go back to being a kid like who's yeah. You know, just no one knows who you are. Mm. You're just a son. Um, and I remember that for those two weeks. Like, I don't want to be going and playing in front of millions of people and mm. everything gets picked apart. Like, I just want to be the kid who's sitting there with mum and dad. Yeah. Um, our, this is not, not the same at all. Um, but earlier, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, earlier this year, we got a call from mum saying that dad had had a heart attack. And um, he's he's totally fine um, now, but I was away and um, I just, I didn't, and mum was saying, don't come back, he's fine. We're on a family holiday for my brother-in-law's wedding. And, but I just wanted to get back, like, and just see him. Um, and yeah, I, it, I, uh, it was, and it, I was really moved by what you said then um, about wanting to be a kid again. Yeah. Because I just wanted to be a little kid and back with dad and play that. I just wanted to revert, even though like I spent so much of my life trying to be an adult, yeah. I was like, suddenly I want to revert to just that old relationship, like more than anything. No, hundred percent. Um, 
yeah, and and I, I found myself thinking so much of my childhood, like since maybe having Albie as well, who's you know my two year old son, but mm. the last few years, and I think as mum, um, yeah, it was you know the end was getting closer. I think I, I thought of our childhood every day for the last I reckon three four years, and like the childhood we were given by mum and dad, and how I'd love to you know give that on to Albie and stuff like that, mm. and um, yeah, it's so far away from playing cricket in front of a big stadium. Mm. And, um, yeah, that's, that's like, that's the real you. That's where you, that's what's important. That's what's going to be still around after cricket. That yeah. was me for 20 years before I started playing for Australia. Like that's, that's your real life. Mm. Um, and I think those kind of moments bring that into focus even more so. Yeah. Wow. Uh, did, yeah. did it, um, like when you hit, when you, your mum's sick and I actually don't know the story. So, um, what was, was it? <laughs> So she had breast cancer, breast cancer about okay. 15 years ago okay. um, right. and then did all the treatment and was pretty good up up until about three to five years, I reckon the last three to five years, yeah. And did that change, you know, I just, because such a big part of your childhood was playing cricket in the backyard, then you are the Australian captain playing on the biggest stage with the biggest cricket responsibility. Does your thinking about being a kid and your mum's sick, um, whether it be in India or wherever you're playing, um, does it change your perspective of playing cricket? For sure. And, and again, I think it takes you back to, you. well, for me, it takes me back to my childhood. Like winning and losing, yeah, like ideally you win, but if not, it's not the end of the world. Um, but it's like, it's fun. <laughs> you know, mm. you're around really good people, you want to enjoy yourself, you want to compete, you want to try hard. Um, but it is just a game. And um, if anything, I've, I've probably found myself more relaxed, um, maybe enjoying it even more, not mm. taking it as seriously, um, not living and dying by kind of results. And I think that's, when I look back to my childhood, that's you just play, like you're just playing to try and have fun, get better. Um, and I, I see a bit more of that probably in the last 12 months from mine. So do you, do you, I mean, not that it's not that you would ever really know this, but do you think that mindset shift, even though it's been completely organic and unconscious, do you think that has played a part in like the enormous success you've had in the last 12 months? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I, I'm, I'm not taking much credit for this, but like, I think it, even COVID had a big um, influence in the way we set up. Mm. Cause, Cause I think for two years, we were traveling around the world, stuck in hotel rooms and you just couldn't do all the things that you'd normally just take for granted. Mm. And you miss a lot of these moments. Like you miss parents getting sick, kids being born, weddings, or even more so than we normally do. So I think our team in the last year or two have been really deliberate in, well, if we're going to be away from our families, let's make sure we're having the time of our lives and mm. playing really good cricket, but it's a game and pack your golf clubs, bring the coffee machine. Like if you're in London, go and explore, go and see a show. Like we're very, we're trying to create as much space in the diary for people to just be able to live their lives. Cause you know, a lot of the time during COVID when we're touring it, it feels like you're wishing the time away and you're wasting time. Mm. Um, and, and that's, well, that's definitely another lesson I learned from mum. It's like, I don't want to waste any time. Like if I'm away, I want to make sure I'm still living life. Yeah. Love it. What is it? Um, there's all. There's certainly a shift that I think. You were. It seems like you you're going home in that time has been part of a shift that, with players like I think, and I definitely don't need to know why, but um, Mitch Marsh came home during the World Cup for a few days and then went back again, and I feel like in the past, they would have been there would have been this outrage, just like how dare you do? It's almost like how dare you leave like obviously yeah. and this Put anything above the cricket team yeah mm. yeah exactly mm. yeah and that would be the way it was framed but it seems that there's a shift from this from the outside that a shift with leadership and i don't know if it's where it comes from but a shift that that's fine and it seems to only be enabling better people and people to um flourish is that a conscious thing or is it just sort of evolved i think it's evolved but like we're dealing with humans here. Mm. So I think in the past, 
you you just no, nope, you've got to play. Like, yep, you're contracted or it's a game for Australia. Like, under no circumstances are you going to miss it. Mm. And to the point where you know people are missing births of their firstborns and and things like that. And you know, it's almost a badge of honour sometimes. You know, like <laughs> yeah. what would you give up to play for this Test mm. match for Australia? Whereas mm. I think everyone's just a bit more understanding now. Um, we play a lot. We spend 10, 11 months of the year on the road. So, I mean, if there's no leniency or flexibility, you'd, you'd miss everything. Mm. So we, we try and manage people as best as we can. I think, you know, in the case of, say, Mitchie, you, he had a um, a death in the family or, you know, even with mum, like, what's the option? You know, do I stay there? And I'm going to be terrible and no good to anyone anyway because my mm. mind's back at home and I'm not at my best. Like, that's not good for anyone. So... We, we want to make sure everyone's in as good a place kind of mentally as they can be, but like selfishly, it's also probably going to be bring out the best cricketer in them as well. You definitely don't need to answer this question. Can I play? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm really fascinated by, do, do you have a memory of when you said bye to your mum, the moment you said bye to your mum? Is that a, a memory that you have? Um, it's kind of probably like the last 10 days, really. Yeah, okay. Um, where, like I was even talking to my sister a couple of days about this, a couple of days ago about this, like they were great. They were, they were an amazing 10 days. Like they were as good a 10 days as I've ever had, which when I look back, it's ridiculous when you say that. But all of us, five kids were together um, with mum and dad and sharing loads of memories. Like it, it was... I, I wouldn't have changed that for anything. Mm. Like I'm, if I was still playing the third test match and missed that, I would regret that forever for sure. Mm. I'm not exactly sure how I'd answer this, but um, can you be re- ready to lose a parent? No. No. I I mean, I, I've never experienced anything close to that. Like mm. I was talking to my sister about this the other day, like we're – quite optimistic people, happy, always have been like never any trauma. Like we've had in in a lot of ways idyllic lives. So, you know, losing a parent almost hits harder sometimes because we're like, how do we deal with this? Like we've had nothing even similar to this. So I think, you know, it wasn't sudden. So you kind of know it's coming and you make the most of those last, whatever, you know, months, years, as best you can, um, knowing that every time is really special. But, yeah, nothing, you know, it's a jolt. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So you go through, so you endure all that. You head back to, you fly over to the UK. Um, you put the Test World Championship against India. But on the horizon is the Ashes, which is really is – I mean, I said before, India is the toughest assignment, but I, I do think the Ashes is the pinnacle of an Australian cricketer's career. It is it is the biggest contest, cricketing contest in the world. Having been through all that, you then come out and the first game is at Edgbaston, um, which is just the most, I mean, I haven't, I've been to the ground, but not during a test match. It seems to me to be the most brutal. Of yeah, playing it's hostile. Violence. Yeah, <laughs> as hostile as it gets. Yeah. From the crowd? Yeah. Really? Yeah, I mean, I was. It's mad. Yeah, it's um <laughs> that that whole what was that pavilion? The, yeah, the, the, the um, stand. Hollies is it the Hollies stand? Yeah, I think yeah. Where they just I think they're allowed to say whatever they well they say whatever they yeah. the most horrific stuff, the most vile to the stuff. players yeah. to you guys. Yeah, yeah. But um, you can't kick out ten thousand people really, so <laughs> <laughs> they're all in. So is there like almost like an unwritten contract that if you sit in there, you know that you're you're you can say whatever you want? It seems like that. Yeah, they all dress up and. Yeah, by lunchtime they're smashed. They're off their head. <laughs> there was a song they were singing. I can't remember what the song was, but the words, the lyrics for Travis Head is a C. That was the whole song. That was like that's wow. the, like those ten thousand people singing that. <laughs> like, What's the subtext of that? Those lyrics though. I want to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it works. <laughs> Does it work on more levels? Or? <laughs> and that was like this is an hour of Travis Head on the boundary cup in that. So wow. It's it's one of the most extraordinary test matches in the history of not just Ashes cricket, but cricket. You guys have to chase 281 in the final innings, which would be the highest run chase ever for an Australian side over in England. And you did it. You come off the ground. 
and you go into the changing rooms and in the rooms there is your dad. Um, and I have – this is Andre Borovec told me this story, a really good mate of mine who's one of the assistant coaches. And he said, you hugged your dad when he came off the ground. And he said, it is the greatest moment I've ever seen in sport, oh. you hugging your dad. It's the oh first God. time the family have been together. Do you remember that moment? I do, yeah. That was – yeah, dad was there and he was sitting there in the stands by himself. And like in 2019, you know, mum and dad did three or four of the Ashes tests and they were sitting up there in the stands together. And um, yeah, just seeing dad there, I was kind of like, he just looked a little bit like so happy, but didn't know what to do. So I was like, kind of dragged him up in the change room and just gave him a big hug. And yeah, we both just broke down, just... Just, just everything over the last few months had hit us. And, um, yeah, that was just so special after, you know, everything that we'd gone through. And, again, so much of our childhood was cricket with mum and dad. So, and I know how much joy they got over the last few years, you know, sitting together at home watching. And so I felt like she was really there as part of that moment. Um, so, yeah, no, that was special. And, like, even – it probably goes back to, like, I, I don't reckon I would have done this a few years ago, but – Bruce Springsteen's like dad's favorite. Like he was basically the eighth family member of us growing up. Like, <laughs> like we would all go to bed and dad would put on some pirated Bruce Springsteen <laughs> playing in Barcelona, speaking <laughs> Spanish type, type movie. And uh, he was performing Aston Villa on night one of that test match. So I got tickets, took dad. So we'd field it all day and then hop straight in a cab from the ground straight to Aston <laughs> <Yeah>. Villa <laughs> and saw Bruce Springsteen all night. So he, he'd had a hell of a week, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, yeah. I, I do love that, the visual of that, though, and the way um, Bora, one of your assistant coaches, told me that story. It was, um, you know, I, I think about our dad as well being a big part of our cricketing journey. Dad loved cricket. He was an amazing cricketer himself. And any time Dad was just there, just sort of felt special. And so mm. to have won the first test off, you know, to be such in, an incredible partnership that you're part of, to have him there with the context of what you've been through. Yeah. What a beautiful moment in sport. Yeah. And yeah. The, the other thing I'd say to that is Andre Borovec has watched more sport than any man. I've ever met. <laughs> so for him to say it's his greatest ever sporting moment, uh, it, it certainly adds weight to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so loss is not – I mean, loss isn't – you say before you've lived a blessed life and it sounds like you very much have. Loss, however, isn't a completely new thing to you. Um, 2014, the cricketing world was rocked by the death of Philip Hughes – um, an incredible young man, incredible young cricketer who was killed doing what he loves, playing cricket. I think most people probably remember that incident. Mm -hmm. um, There's yeah. a shield game. I, I've actually never heard you talk on this before. I haven't heard your – because I one of the things that really fascinates me is that he he was hit by a bouncer, so a short ball that was effectively meant to hit him. Yeah. And a big part of what you do is trying to intimidate and scare batsmen. You do it better than anyone in the world. Um, uh, I'm interested how that made you feel at that time. Yeah, I was – so I was at 2014, so I would have been 21. Um, I, w I wasn't playing that game. Um, I was actually at the CG that day but, but wasn't playing. But it was, you know – we were all kind of young to mid twenties when I think of the Aussie team or New South Wales team, and we'd never experienced anything like that really. Any of us, like no one had had the death of a mate. So it took a fair while where you just didn't know what to do. Like, like we're playing an innocent game of cricket, and you, know, you knew you could get injured or you might be able to, you might get hurt, but I didn't know you could like die playing cricket. So I. I Definitely for the next couple of years, every time you bowl a bouncer, it went through your head before you ran in. And you're just like, okay, this is what I'm signing up for if I'm bowling a bouncer here. Um, and, and I think even since then, like before that, I used to quite enjoy, maybe it's a little brother of me, but I used to quite enjoy hitting people. And mm -hmm. it was, you know, seeing them squirm and jump around. Like I used to get some sadistic joy out of that. I, I don't think so anymore. Mm -hmm. I think it's... It is just a tactic to try and muck up their feet and get a wicket. Mm. Um, whereas I don't think that's always the case beforehand. It was intimidation. It was yeah. It was, it was flexing. Kind of thing. Yeah, flexing yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas I, I've not felt that anywhere near 
in the last few years. It's just like, that could be me, like, yeah. you know, batting or bowling. Yeah. Do you think it, have you ever imagined that it informed your, the stuff you're talking about before about cricket, about how it's just a game we need to have fun while we're doing it? Do you, have you ever considered that that has informed your attitude to cricket? Potentially. Um, yeah, I probably don't think about that as sort of consciously. Yeah, as consciously. Yeah. Like what what I do remember from that moment though, which I do think about consciously is how the whole cricket world was brought together. And you know, I thought how, how beautiful it was and how much good can be done through sport and cricket um, mm-hmm. in uniting people. And um, I think about that quite a bit. Yeah. Whereas, you know, a lot of the time it, it is quite, you know, it's used to divide people sometimes, especially here in Australia, you yeah. know, anything to do with crickets. Um, you're trying to take a one side of the fence and kind of, you know, um, us first them or whatever. So mm. I, I found that was a really beautiful moment that summer. Um, the way kind of after that horrible event, everyone was brought together. I mean, that, the, 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 the ripples of that were felt all through the cricketing world. And I remember very much um, my experience back then playing grade cricket was that session. I remember, I think he, he either died on a Tuesday or a Thursday, but it was a training day. And I got down to the club, Melbourne University, and no one was in the nets. There's usually people starting up. There was no one. Everyone was just sitting around. It was very quiet. And in the end, we went into the, into the changing rooms. The whole club was like 45, 50 guys. And everyone, we had post-it notes. I can't remember why they were there. It was probably some planning day or something, but then we ended up everyone just writing down three things they're grateful for in their life. And we put them up on the wall and that was it. And then we went home. It was like a 25 minute session and they sat on the, that they remained on the, on the notice board for the rest of the season. And it was almost like a, and if so, I was reading through them so much of us. I'm so grateful for my relationship with cricket and for how close it makes me and my dad or me and my family is my journey of cricket. And it was a really there was no, and Phil Hughes wasn't name wasn't written on anything there. It was just a really beautiful tribute to the game of cricket and what it means to be a young person who loves cricket. Amazing, yeah, um, yeah. I'll never forget that session. I played for much longer than I should have, and that's one of the sessions I'll never ever forget. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I think about um, like even now when I think about you know Albie growing up and things like that. I'm so lucky to have cricket, even. You know, going through school because I played for Penrith Cricket Club, very different to school. Our mm. school wasn't really sporty or anything like that. But you know, if anything's going on at school and that's stressful, friendships or whatever, I had this other world cricket, and it was like a big hug, really, where you've got a hundred, or well, maybe you know, sixty, seventy guys of all different ages, all different walks of life, occupations, um, just all come together for their shared love of cricket and kind of look after each other and. Yeah, it's something really special to to cricket. It is. It is a big hug, isn't it? It's a because it's also it's the players, but also their partners and their families. And you just feel like you've got this. You turn up on Saturday morning, and it's everyone cares so much about each other, the families and everyone. It's a it's a beautiful community to be a part of. Yeah, everyone's welcome. Like especially you know Penrith where where we played, um, not you know not a really you know wealthy area. Um, so lots of different backgrounds and just the way, you know, 18, nine year olds going, going through tough stuff, you know, trying to leave school or trying to find work or just going through tough periods in their time where the club would just put their arm around them and just look after them for a couple of years. It was, was amazing. Yeah. You also have the ability to have best friends all over the world. Like you can go to yeah. a season in England. I went there and all of a sudden I had 30 best friends in England just because I came to a new club and all of a sudden it's a, it's a great experience. Even, yeah, we, you know, travel to England all the time now, but some of our coaches would go, oh, we're just going for a beer with Barry who played great cricket with 43 years ago or something, <laughs> oh, you know, no. catching up with him. It's it's great. It, yeah, I, I was, because uh, you, sometimes there's too much of an emphasis on the deficit and negative examples of clubs, I think, but I, the, I was really lucky to play at a, an amazing club um, with you here. Um, at Melbourne Uni and I remember I just had this flashback to this thing that happened when I was like what are we 19 or 20 I just started full-time work and when you start a new job and you're full-time and you're young you just feel like the biggest idiot all the time because you're getting everything wrong you've never worked full hours you've got like not necessarily like there were some good people but also some people at the office making you feel like an idiot all this kind of stuff and I remember going to cricket training 
I wasn't a very good cricketer. I was playing like, well, comparatively at the club, I was playing the I was sort of playing fourth and third eleven cricket. And the captain of the club, this guy called Nick Williams, saw me like standing at the top of my mark, looking not great. And he was like, you okay? And I was like, and I started to well up a bit. And he's like, let's go for a walk. And he put his ball down. We went for a walk around the oval. And I just cried about how much I was struggling at work. And he put his arm around me. And it's like, it, it's making me emotional now <laughs> saying, which is weird because it happened so long ago. But I just had a group of older men who were like looking out for me and wanted the best for me and were there to give me a hug when I needed it. And it's, I don't think you hear that enough about sporting clubs. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Mm, yeah. It was really special. Well done, Willow. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> it was great. Anyway, um, <laughs> so no, no, it's, a, it's, it's that summarizes to me. You've just got so many big brothers and sisters, and all of a sudden, mm. yeah, you're part of a family. Yeah, yeah. Sort of also like tell like says to me like that's the opportunity of of club sport. Mm. Um, that that's I mean. I, this is probably obvious to anyone who plays club sport because it's just such like an inherent part of what it is. But I've never been like really closely a part of a sporting club like that. So to me, I just think, oh, that completely changes the goalposts. Um, <laughs> it completely changes the the view of what a of what a club of what a club is and, and can be yeah. and what it can be. Can be yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. And any team, any group of people, I think like that's I'm sure you'd do anything for that guy you know that yeah, yeah. season and you'd be trying even harder now like and i yeah. think that's that's the opportunity for any group or team and yeah in the australian team's no different it's if you look after the people and you do it well and you make it a place where people want to be and feel safe like you're going to get the best out of them mm. but it doesn't take much to be the opposite and you want people and people start wanting to avoid that place or not open up and well i imagine like because what i know of um just what I hear of, this is more like in the in the olden days of like particularly like men's sporting clubs, it was much more macho and like don't show any emotion, you know, be you'd be very closed off and we're here to play sport and we're here to drink piss yeah. and, you know, <laughs> and, and that's it and don't you fucking cry, mate. <laughs> um, but it seems like it's changed a lot. Uh, I think that's... Like even in ten years, I reckon it's changed a bit. Like since when I first started playing, but I mean, I'm sure footy's the same, but cricket's so much like that, especially in the history. Like mm. it was, if you're debuting the team, like mate, your bag's going out the front. You're not allowed in the change room, or yeah. you know, like you'll speak when you're spoken to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're you're four or five years away from sitting with us in this corner of the change. Like room. literally. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, it's just. That's how it was. Mm. So, like your experience, Josh, like that's, yeah, you, you're right. You're that's like, abnormal. Yeah, yeah. That, that's abnormal. Like that's mm. that's not what we're meant to do. We're meant to just run in. If you're feeling sad, go and bowl a bouncer. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just bowl it out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I think it is changing. Like I think the world's changing, and yeah, I hope hope clubs is changing. But my experience at Penrith was very much that was like, you just bring yourself to the club and be whoever you want and. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. nice. Beautiful. So this podcast is called The Imperfects. I have this story from um, Andre Borovic about you. He said, I don't, I don't, he didn't say where the tour was, but apparently you guys were touring somewhere, a lot of travel, and you you had a massive pimple on your chin. <laughs> <laughs> and a, and it was during the World Cup. It was during the World Cup. Yeah. Okay. And apparently the team manager was giving out everyone's plane tickets. Um, <laughs> and you asked if your pimple could have a ticket as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then at one point you said, and then I think you requested extra leg room for your yeah. <laughs> <'cause you're> people. <laughs> and you said to me that you are someone who really embraces imperfection as part of you as a person and also as part of your cricketing journey. Um, he says that you guys also, in your team meetings, and you will drive this a lot, you'll talk about, and I would love this so much, you guys will discuss how you want to fail during the game. Like how do we want to fail today? I love that so much. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, first of all, like imperfections are funny. <laughs> so, like, if if you if you're not highlighting them in a group of twenty guys, like, it's a pretty dull environment. So, like, you got to take the piss out of yourself and, yep. and have fun. Um, but yeah, we talk a lot about yeah how we want to fail, and I suppose the the subtext of that is like you will fail, so let's accept that and let's try and work out the style that we want to play 
Um, so, for example, in, in one day cricket, you can fail in a million different ways, but we want to be aggressive. We want to take the game on. So we fail like that. We can accept that. No stress at all. But if we're being meek and timid and waiting for the game to come to us and, and we get out, say, blocking, that's not acceptable. So I think once you start reframing how how we want to fail, um, how we want to play really, and, and just taking all stress away from failure, that's where you see guys play with freedom, open up, and that's what I think brings the best out of our guys. I find that so analogous to life. Like it, working out how you want to fail in life as mm. well, I think is beautiful. It's I sca- love it that. Scare- it kind of scares me to be honest. Even just thinking about like even saying out loud or thinking about how you want to fail because it kind of it's you're really in a, a a vulnerable state when you're kind of like thinking actively about failing, particularly when it's around something that you care about so much. So if it's like for me, if it's about you know making TV or even this podcast, it's like things that you care about. When you think about failing at it, that is terrifying. Yeah. No, and, and sport, there's so much pressure on us playing that the old kind of way of this is the biggest game of your life and basically all the Hollywood speeches, I don't think that's really motivating. I, th- I think it's the opposite. Like how do we strip pressure away from the guys? Mm. So, you know, if, if you fail, people see that as the end point in your own mind. Like if I fail this game, like you're not even thinking next week. Whereas I think the more you can de-stress it and think, okay, if we play this way, yeah, of course you're going to fail along the way, but over the course of 10, 15 games, whatever it is, this is going to bring the best out of yourself. And almost, for me anyway, it takes the pressure off that one instance, that like kind of short term, and you, it makes you zoom out and, and look a bit longer term because, yeah, that's life. You're going to fail and, yeah, you've got to know there's a road back. You'll be fine. Can can Do you mind... Um uh, and, and I don't ask this with any story in mind because, like I said, I don't. I really, I don't follow the cricket at all. But on failure, is there a failure that comes to mind for you, which is like your big, as a player, a big failure that you were able to kind of work through or that really affected you in any way? Oh, loads, heaps. Um, and I'd say most of most of them come back to me being trying to play too safely so you know as a batter I'm what we call a maggot stabber <laughs> in a test match just just oh, yeah, can't yeah, score a run <laughs> no 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 explanation needed <laughs> okay um, yeah, no actually some explanation <laughs> is needed sorry well like super rigid like just trying to knock it out Okay. And uh, well, this has made me a few years ago. I've actually never heard that expression. Is no. that a new? I think it's new. Yeah, okay. I think it's a new cricket maggot term. Stab. Yeah, maggot stabber. How does it come about? Like just like you're looking like you're stabbing maggots. Like oh. you're hardly <laughs> playing a shot. Oh. You know, like, yeah, you're yeah, not rigid. following through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so for me, like that's not acceptable. I'm rigid. I'm not going to put any pressure back on the bowl. I'm not going to score. Mm-hmm. So I, in the last couple of years, just try to be okay with getting out, playing a bit more aggressively at times. Um, one day cricket, the World Cup, I reckon for the last few years I've been pretty safe. You're just like, okay, just don't want to go for too many runs. But really, if you go for four and over or five and over, it doesn't really change the game. Like you've got to try and take wickets. But to take wickets, you've got to take risks. So I've changed that a bit in the last year. I reckon I've started by more bounces, more slower balls, setting different fields. Um, yeah, loads of times where I failed and kind of gone well. If I want to be the best I can I've got to take a few more risks yeah. uh, I mean yeah I feel like don't be a maggot stabber is a pretty good yeah. philosophy for life <laughs> put that on your put that on your wall yeah. on your inspirational poster yeah <laughs> wow I love that I'm going to read you a stoic quote here and I want to see if you know what it's in reference to something that you said recently the quote is it's from Epictetus he says it is impossible for a man to learn what he thinks he already knows uh and I do have another one on a similar vein if it helps. Okay, go for it. If you wish to improve, be content to appear clueless or stupid. Epictetus again. <laughs> I can think of a hundred times I've, <laughs> I've, I've done that. Um, no, no you, specific. Like okay. I, I can probably give you 10 specifics, but... Okay, well, I'll give you the one I'm thinking of. You said the other day, and it was one of my favourite things I've ever heard you say. <laughs> so just, Ryan, for background for you. So part of, as a captain... 
you when you toss a coin, you decide to bat or bowl, mm-hmm. and it's pretty much dependent on what on, on what the pitch looks like, what yep. it's going to do. Yep. And so captains all around the world at any level will claim <laughs> to know absolutely everything about the wicket and it's such oh, a flex yeah. Yeah. as a captain to tell younger players what the wicket's doing what it's going to do well surely if you're at the wacky you'd be you'd be bowling because that's a harder wicket isn't it? get the fast bowlers out there yeah possibly um and so <laughs> and but it's like it's just something that's passed down to you from like yeah. i actually look back i didn't really understand but i'd always take great joy in telling everyone in my team what the wicket was going to do uh, at what point of the day when it was going to get better when it was going to be difficult even what though you didn't know. Meant, well, I thought I did, but uh, looking back, I didn't really. Yeah, okay. I just pretended I did, and yeah. I just loved telling everyone, younger players, <laughs> like. And when I was right, I'd love going. Yeah, we did. We did discuss this. How it was going to happen. <laughs> you said the other day, uh, and <laughs> Captain Australian cricket team, you said, "Yeah, I'm not really good at reading wickets. I've never been that good at it." And I nearly fell off my chair. And I thought, yeah, actually, neither was I. Why did I pretend to be? <laughs> what, so, is that, that an outrageous thing to say? Well, yeah, it's a beautiful so. thing to say. Mm. I love yeah. it so much, but in the, in cricketing context and cricketing world, it's a bold thing to say, definitely. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't think anyone's good at reading wickets, that's, and that's probably to my point. It's like I've got all the data in the world. I've seen this over three days getting ready for a game, and I still don't know what it's going to do. And half the time, the groundsmen don't even know what it's going to do. So but everyone like, pretends. But everyone time. pretends. Okay, so, so where do you get the confidence to go, actually, do you know what? I don't know. No one's ever done that before. Well, like... I think you're allowed to not know everything. <laughs> yeah, you know, like it, it's okay to be just put your hand up and say, "I don't know." Like that—that's fine. So, I, I, don't I, know. Like, I mean, I agree with you, but I—I I just love the—I don't know if courage is the right word, but just the insight to go. No, actually, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I mean, I think it presents a path forward when you just say, "I don't know." It's like, okay, well, let's work this out together, and you start going back to your principles of, you know, yeah. okay. Sound at different people. What does a wicket normally do? Like, if you just walk out and go, oh, this is how it's going to play or like anything, like this is how you've got to do something. Well, that's the end of the story. You don't really get better. You don't. So I don't know. I'm just, I tell our guys all the time, like you're allowed to not know something. Like if I ask you something and you don't know, just tell me, I don't know. I go, perfect. I'll go and find, ask someone else. Like there's no shame in that at all. So I don't know. I feel like I've said that a hundred times. <laughs> Every time I get asked about a wicket, I'm like, mm, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's amazing. It's a beautiful lesson for life in general. Like I feel like my life got better the moment I started admitting in work that I don't know things. It was like suddenly it was this weight off my shoulder. I could just admit that sort of have a general feeling like I reckon I can do that stuff pretty well, but I don't know anything about that. And I feel like I should, but I don't. And then I learnt it. And like without, if I'd always pretended that I knew this stuff, then I'd never learn it or I wouldn't get other people involved who do know that stuff better than me and then it becomes beautifully collaborative. And Well, it's, hard, yeah. it's really hard to relate to and connect with someone who seemingly knows everything. Absolutely. Like to kind of actually connect with the expert is like, ah, oh, that I don't... That doesn't resonate with me because I don't know everything. I'll never tell anyone. But, I, I don't, <laughs> but then, to, then when the Australian cricket captain or anyone of uh, with with status or some sort of you know some sort of leadership role, yeah, says like I don't actually I don't know. You're like, oh yeah, of course you don't because you're just the person like I am. Yeah. yeah. But it's so refreshing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think some things aren't black and white. Like a pitch. We're talking about something that's nature. Like it's it's a bit of dirt that's uses the sun to heat it up and a certain amount of water, but like, mm. it's, it's natural. Like no one knows, <laughs> you know, so there are some things that you can't definitively really say this is yeah. mm. X, Y, Z, you know. That makes sense when you explain it, but yeah, but like you said, like to say it is, sounds really bold, but it mm. sort of applies to any industry really. The person who should know something for them to then say, I actually don't know the thing that I'm supposed to know is yeah, bold. Yeah. <laughs> but freeing. But very freeing and yeah. refreshing. I love yeah. it. Mm. Do you ever, do you ever, when you're walking or at a cafe or just hanging out by yourself, do you ever just stop and go, oh God, I'm the Australian cricket captain. Does that happen to you? Yeah, it does. It does a little bit. It, it certainly did for the first few months when I, when I became captain. Um, I found myself like, I'd, I'd wake up in the morning going, oh shit, what's, 
what should an Australian captain do today? <laughs> <laughs> How should an Australian captain act? <laughs> and, what do you, and what do you think? What do you say? What do you answer? Well, then, then I would kind of come back to you and go, shit, I don't know. I've, I've known a few captains. Uh, what would they do? Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know them. I only know me. Shit. <laughs> and then I would kind of be like, well, other people picked you. So I'm just going to do me and until anyone tells me not to. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Pretty good answer. <laughs> How much do you love Albie? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> great, yeah. great question. Hard hitting <laughs> question. <laughs> End with a real hard ball. Yeah. She's real bouncer to finish it off. <laughs> no, I was even just saying to Hugh on the way in, like Albie was up. Uh, so we just came to Melbourne last night and he was, you know, change of scene. He's up at five o'clock. Um, so I went into his room and, but it was great. He was just hitting me in the face for two hours, but I loved it. He just like <laughs> a cheeky smile. So he's, a, yeah, can't get enough of him. Um, the relationship between do you, is there a sense of gratitude? Just I'm going back to your mum here, but that she got to know Albie. Yeah, definitely. Like one one of the original diagnoses is diagnoses. 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 Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, was uh, when Becky was pregnant with Albie, but mum was only given a few months to live. Mm. Yeah. So that was I was you know straight away you think I was she's never going to be able to meet Albie. Um, but she made it to his first birthday. Mm. So to have all those memories together is like be able to talk about parenthood together as well for the first year or so. Um, yeah, really special. And yeah, got some, got some amazing photos along the way that are up around the house. How conscious of you at his first birthday of the fact your mum was there and that was how special, were you, were you aware of that at the time? Were you thinking that at the time? Yeah. 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 I think at any moment, like for those last year or two, like any family get together, like, yeah, really conscious. Like after the last test match last year, we went and got an Airbnb for about 10 days, kind of when everyone goes, plays Big Bash, um, just around the corner from mum and dad's and we spent every day with mum and dad. So I, I don't think we'd do that in a thousand years if we didn't know kind of that mum was, um, yeah, towards the end. So like it, it does give you real clarity. It does make you appreciate all the moments along the way. She obviously has had such an impact on you throughout her life. How do you, do you still feel a connection with her now or how does that work? I, I've never, having never lost a parent, I don't know what it's like. Yeah, for sure. I, I think, well, I'm, I'm sure everyone would, would do it slightly differently, but I mean, my, my experience over the last what, about nine months is like pops up every day in yeah decision-making, how you want to live your life, how you want to, I don't know, you know, when things knock you around, you're copying backlash or whatever, like I think of her all the time, what would she say, what would she think, um, what would, you know, be her little bits of advice. Um, but I, I'd say mostly through being a dad now with Albie and, um, yeah, how she was as a parent to us and the things I used to love and things that used to be helpful and um, even just, just the... Uh, like you realize how many sacrifices they made <laughs> as parents, though you have to make as parents to give your child a good life or good opportunities or those things, which um, you don't really fully appreciate as a, a child. So I, I find myself every day kind of thinking about, yeah, mum and what she would do in this situation. Um, yeah. Um, you don't have to go here if you don't want to, but is it hard to see Albie grow and not be able to share that with her? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, like you, you think, well, you know, my, even my grandparents and things like that. Like, okay, yeah, you, you know, you're a kid, then you have kids, you're an adult, you become a parent, then you become a grandparent, and you kind of you know have those great years. Whereas, obviously, mum's was a little bit shortened, and yeah, it is hard because you're like, oh, she's done all these kind of things along the way and giving up so much of her life to be a mum of five kids and um, you know, almost you, you kind of, in my head, the grandparent years are kind of the happy years where you, um, you're sitting back enjoying kind of the fruits of your labour. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's hard, but she's with us, you know, every day and, um, yeah, still talk about it all the time too. Yeah. yeah. There's a, um, again, a person I didn't think I'd bring up in this, not Django Reinhardt this time, but uh, Nick Cave um, in an incredible interview I heard recently where he talks about the loss of his uh, son and that you can, and that I'm going to get this wrong because he's obviously he's Nick Cave, he'll say it better than I do, 
but the way he talked about when you the dealing with grief that you can sort of harden around the grief and sort of close off and it becomes a sort of hard defensive enclosing mechanism and then he talks about the opposite where you can lean into it and feel the universal experience of grief that everyone in the world feels um and it can be an incredibly connecting um way of dealing with grief and there's something that just popped into my head there that i feel like and i don't mean to psychoanalyze you at all but there's this beautiful strain of thought that you seem to have that with when we're talking about phil hughes and with your mum and also now hearing talking about the birth of a child where you seem to look outwards and it, this thing of like the best way I can think about it is that we're only human, this sort of beautiful outward looking approach. I just think, I don't know if there's a question in there, but I just wanted to acknowledge and say what a beautiful thing it is that you've got that attitude and that um, way of moving. Yeah. Thanks for that, mate. Um, and I, yeah, I think, you know, life experiences, having a baby, like losing mum, even just being in this job, like, you just grow like quicker than you probably expect to. Um, mm. But yeah, I think in the last few years, yeah, I've changed a lot. Kind of the, the way you want to shape your own life or the way I want to shape my own life and live my own life. And I think I think a lot about when I'm 60, 70, 80, looking back, how do I wish I lived these years? And, um, you know, I think... Jeff Bezos has a has a quote that I really like where it's or a tool where he says you know the regret minimization tool where he's going to look back and okay which decision did I make that I'm going to regret less when I'm mm. you know looking 40 50 years ahead um so I think yeah a lot of those experiences over the last couple of years has helped me shape a lot of the ways um yeah the way I see the see the world yeah beautiful any in swinging Yorkers from you, Ryan? Oh, you know me. <laughs> love, uh, I love a plum. <laughs> you like cherry? Plums? I like plums. Oh, I like, yeah, the cherry or, yeah, yeah getting them plumbed. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, enough, enough fruit <laughs> cricket references. Oh, I do have, I have one, one thought because just off what you said, Josh, about like how you, Pat, like kind of react to, you know, quite sort of significant, um, often, like, not often, but a few traumatic moments you've had in like the last 10 years, particularly. Um, one thing that I, I've sort of noticed is like, you've got a real sense of like positivity, mm. uh, which I know, I, I mean, I know a little bit about from like the impact that positivity can have on other people, but is that, is positivity a conscious thing for you? Uh, I'd say a little bit, but I'd say... 95% of it comes from just the way I'm wired, I think. Yeah. Like, yeah, we're lucky. Our, I see your brothers and sisters are really positive. Mum and dad are always positive. Um, yeah, just ne never, nothing really ever popped up that would, you know, really knock them around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, cancer, illnesses, whatever, setbacks. It's like, ah, it's all right, you know, we'll, we'll get through this and, and get to the mm -hmm. other side and, Look how lucky we are, you know, um, family dinners all the time would always be like before we ate. Just think how lucky we are to be living in Australia and have food on the table and be did healthy. Did consciously talk about that? I, I didn't, but mum and dad they would. They did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So right. that was kind of drilled into us. So, yeah, I think there's always someone worse off than what you are, no matter what you're going through. And, yeah, it's I don't necessarily consciously think of that. I think it's just been probably instilled into us kids since, yeah, forever. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Beautiful. I, I guess I just want to finish by saying I think the cricketing CV speaks for itself and it's extraordinary already and there's so much, you've got so much ahead of you still. But I think for me it's more of a congratulations on the person that you are and the person that you are. I, I, I think the more people like you we have in the world setting the example that you're setting to young people. You know, I, I grew up looking, at, looking up to Steve Waugh and just like I couldn't believe – Someone could be so great as Steve Waugh. And that was purely based off his cut shot, really. Um, <laughs> it was a nice cut shot. <laughs> oh, it was delightful. But um, I look at the person that you are and the example that you set to young people around this country. It's, um, yeah, I, th I think I, I think the state of 
you know, I, I mean, I look at youth and, and what they're looking up to these days and to know they're looking up to you, I think is, is it holds the country in good stead. So you're a wonderful career captain, but an even better person. And thank you for joining us. Yeah, I today. appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks for chatting. It was great. Thanks. Loved it. Wow. Well, I know I'm not a big cricket fan, but I feel pretty safe to say that the Australian cricket team is in pretty safe hands with Pat Cummins. What a, and actually, speaking of hands, <laughs> how how the, I couldn't stop thinking about it during the interview. <laughs> How's Elsie's fingers now? Is oh, she? Yeah. Is, oh, it was an awful moment because when she took her fingers out of the cupboard, they were they were flat like. There were two fingers, the top above the top knuckle, they were flat. What, like a cartoon? Like when like, a, like yeah. a pancake, yes. Like, like, like you would expect. It was, so I thought, well, all those bones are completely crushed. That's why I thought that this is what happened to Pat Cummins, exactly oh. the same thing. Yeah. And she screamed and screamed. We took her to the hospital. And by the time we got to the hospital, they were huge. They would like swollen up. And I, their doctor looked at them and said, yeah, she's pretty young. Bones are pretty squashy when they're young. Oh. I think that's fine. And he just like made her bend her fingers. He goes, yeah, she's fine. So I just... Like, wow, yeah, was he like eating lunch at the time? Just can't be bothered. He's like, Yeah, I can, I can, should be fine. <laughs> so, no, Elsie getting through was, his salmon sushi rolls. Elsie was totally fine. She references it a lot, she brings up a lot. She always says, Remember that time my fingers went flat? Uh, yeah, I'll never forget it. Elsie, but, Jeez. so yes, she's wow. okay. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, but there was a lot, I mean, uh, there was so much that stood out to me in that interview. The thing I wanted to talk about. Um, when I look back on it was... We should also say, actually, for those who are new to the podcast this year or haven't heard us yeah. before, yeah. what we often do after these sorts of episodes is we'll come back and talk about like a key takeaway or something that might be practical or helpful for you that you usually talk about. Yeah, mm. yeah. so the thing that stood out to me the most, to be really honest, was the power of belonging to a club. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that. I, w- I was going to, and then Josh called me this morning and said he thought the most powerful bit, which upon reflection I think is very true, where Pat talked about identifying the way that they want to fail. Like mm-hmm. they talk about as a team, how do they want to fail today? And I totally agree, Josh. That is, I mean, for me, that is just the most amazing takeaway to get yeah. from this. He talked about in reference to Mitch Marsh, who's a very aggressive um, batsman who who bashes the ball a really long way. They would rather see him going out, trying to do that, do what he does really well, as opposed to just blocking and blocking and getting himself in, which I, I think is a lovely way. It's such a great metaphor for life really to work. Mm. So, but I, I got me thinking about my life and some of my great failures, especially when I was much younger. And if I'd had that in the back of my mind before I'd gone into the situation, how do I want to fail today? Mm. It would have changed everything for me. And it made me realize the irony of this question, how do you want to fail actually helped me recover from the Pat Cummins interview. So when I say recover, I was so excited about this Pat Cummins interview, and just a bit. We've been we've been doing this. <laughs> Do you think the listeners could tell? <laughs> we've been doing this every, every day. How many sleeps, Bridge? How many sleeps till Pat comes in? <laughs> so we've been doing this podcast for five, six years now. We've mm. interviewed a lot of people. This is by far the most preparation I've ever done. I mean, to be honest, sitting in a cafe and just typing Pat Cummins into YouTube is a wonderful way to spend your time. Yeah, but I also didn't think you needed to spend two days in the nets, but you did. (laughs) (laughs) Just in case he asks me to bowl. Uh, I did so much reading and research. I had so many notes. I've never had that before. In fact, I actually almost sort of wrote, I've never done this. I always do lots of research and then I put the iPad away and I just let my talking skills and listening skills work Mm. or happen. But I was so prepared. I had so many notes. I had so many things in my head that I was so disappointed. As soon as I said goodbye to Pat when he got out of the car, I was so down on myself for the interview. I thought that's mm. the worst interview I've ever done. And I cannot believe I've done that with Pat. Mm. Um, I was so flat at the fact that I had just sort of almost like tried to stay to a script rather than just letting the conversation flow. And, yeah. and I was really down on myself. And then I, the next day I was thinking about it. I woke up. First thing I thought of it was like, oh, you stuffed at the Pat Cummins interview. So that was good. But then I thought about the question, how do you want to fail? And that gave me instantly, I thought, well, do you know what? I'd much rather fail from being overprepared yeah. mm. than failing from not putting it work in. Oh, that's yeah. such a good point. So if so, if I woke up next morning, I was like, oh, I cannot believe I didn't prepare for that. I did such a bad job because I yes. wasn't prepared. Yeah. So I straight away, well, do you know what? I'm happy with that failure. Like I, yeah. like that's a better way to fail, being overprepared than underprepared. That is um, really mm. good. And so, And I think back, I mean, there's so many situations in my life where – um, I have, I, I wish so much 
that I actually had that lens or that that question to pose to myself before I made a big decision. Yeah, because that particular example though is like we all know that feeling of like getting to the situation. Like one of my um, regular nightmare dreams is arriving on set to act in a show and I've never looked at the script. Yeah. And I've got wow. all these lines and I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't. And, and that's actually happened in real life where I've like been on shows and I just clearly haven't learned the lines well enough. And it's shock. It's just terrifying the feeling of oh, being unprepared. Yeah. 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 And yeah so, I have the exam dream. I'm sure everyone's got oh, the like exam high one, school yeah. exam yeah. thing. Yeah. I have your exam dream, weirdly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I know your lines. <laughs> yeah. That's strange. I imagine yeah. myself as Josh Van Kylenberg <laughs> doing an exam. It's really weird. Yeah. So, yeah. But I think, uh, I mean, there are other examples. I, I, there's one that I have when I, um, Coincidentally, when, when I worked with the Australian cricket team. Wow. And as you guys know, I've, I've presented to, I feel like nearly every elite sporting club in Australia or side in Australia. But the Australian cricket team, I, I did a really bad job. And again, if I'd had this question framed beforehand, if I was able to work through this template, it would have been totally different. But they booked me and it was in Brisbane um, and I flew up there and they, they said, oh, the players have that day off. It's one of the only days off they have all summer. So they might head out for a drink the night before um, and feel free to join them if you want to. And I know that when I'm hungover, I have really poor verbal fluency. Mm. And I, I think like a lot of people, I don't have great self-esteem when I'm yeah. hungover. I'm, I don't have much confidence. And you need to have confidence to do, you mm. need to feel confident when you get speaking mm. in front of anyone. Mm. And verbal fluency. And verbal fluency, yeah. the two things you really need to have. So there came a point when I'd arrived in Brisbane, I checked into my hotel room, one of the guys said, um, do you want to come and have a beer with us? And I said yes because I wanted to have that connection with them and I wanted I thought that might make the talk a bit better mm. up to a point. And so there then came a point when I'd been at the pub and I'd had one beer and I thought this is the time to go. I've sort of made a connection, said g'day, met them mm. all and I need I, I, I wish so much looking back I had the confidence to say to them, um, been great to meet you all, but I need to go because I've got to get up and present to you all tomorrow morning, which would be totally understandable from oh, that point of view. Oh, come on, softy. <laughs> Stay for another drink, mate. <laughs> That's what I would have said. <laughs> Classic me. <laughs> and, and so that was a the point there. If I'd had the lens of like, how do you want to fail? It's like, if I'm staying for longer than one beer, I know I'm going to fail because the talk isn't going to be good. Yeah. Whereas surely, I mean, looking back on it now, if I had that thing of how do I want to fail... I choose to fail at becoming best mates with them over beers, mm. but I chose the failure that I chose was I'll do a not as good talk. Mm. Um, and I should have looked at what, um, what am I here to do? I'm here to, to engage them on the topic of mental health and yeah, resilience, that, but instead, yeah. So I didn't, I don't know if that makes sense. Is yeah, that, it does. I mean, I've been thinking about it a lot, hence why I brought it up with you. And I, I think for me, it's being, it's the first door to being willing to fail, admitting that you're going to, and then you're allowed to look at the options of how you're going to do it. But for yeah. me, even looking at admitting the fact that I will fail is really daunting. And it means that you don't take opportunities and you don't, well, I don't take opportunities and don't try as much because of the fear of what that's going to feel like to fail at something. But by having a mindset shift of going, well, it's good, you're going to fail in one way or another, it's just such a fundamental shift that allows me to go, well, I'm going to feel failure either way. I may as well feel it trying to get up and sing that song in front of people last year or whatever yeah. it might be this year. Yeah, I mean, for you, that's a great example. You with the song is that yeah. it could be that you don't quite nail the song, but you still get up and you write it and you perform it. You may not perform it as mm. well as you want or you don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Like, how do I want to fail there? I want to fail by giving it my best. And if people didn't like it, that's okay. Would have crushed me to fail by, I mean, I was close to, by pulling out and saying, I just don't think I can do it. Like, this is my failure now, stopping. Did you say that at one point? I was pretty close. Really? Yeah. yeah. Mm. So this is for the live tour we did last, last year. year. And we're doing this and, year as well. Yeah, doing yeah. it at the moment. I, I, um, I guess the question, it, it encourages risk-taking, I reckon. Yeah. And I think like good calculated risk-taking because it allows you to really think about what you're doing Yeah. and go, I'm going to give that a crack. Whatever I mean, I, I feel like there's, there's genuinely no better analogy, analogy in my life than cricket, the one that Pat Cummins mm. gave us around Mitch Marsh. The way he, <laughs> mm. I, I can't think of a better example of that. It's just, it's yeah. so good. Yep. Um, but I love it for, I love it for any endeavor in your life, anything you're unsure of, how do I want to fail here? There's a good chance I'll fail either way. Mm. Which, which, which path is going to lead to more growth? Which path is going to lead to me being a better place? Um, yep. I think is a nice um, process to go through mentally. Yeah. 
Agreed. That's unreal. I love that. Thanks, Pat. Well, so, so good to be back. What a cool way to start the year with Australian captain Pat Cummins. Yeah, <laughs> and we is. have, we've got some, like this year is bumper to bumper. Like, mm. there's, I can't believe who's on the podcast this year. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's intimidating. It is intimidating. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll, um, but you know, it's how we're choosing to fail. Get big names on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Get big names on and do terrible interviews. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so thanks for coming back this year. Great, great to be back. And we can't wait to be speaking to you on Thursday. Yeah, for the Imperfects. <laughs> <laughs>